Good morning, church. How is everyone? Uh, my name is Cody King. I'm one of the Connections pastors here, and I want to say welcome once again. Uh, glad that you chose to spend some time with us this morning. And uh, if you are a first-time guest, um, this is um, our third week in our series called Upside Down. And um, it's called Upside Down because we're walking through uh, the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew 5, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, it's Jesus' uh, greatest sermon. It's, it's, it's probably the greatest sermon that was ever given. And Jesus begins his earthly ministry with this sermon, and he starts with these eight blessings. And I think it's interesting that Jesus begins his ministry with these blessings. If you look at the end of the Old Testament, the very last thing that the Lord says to his people is that I'm going to send someone to you and you need to follow that person. If you don't follow that person, I will come and I will bring destruction upon you if you don't. So the end of the Old Testament, the Old Testament ends with possible destruction when someone comes and if we don't follow him. And then here at the beginning of the New Testament, the beginning of Jesus's ministry, as he comes, he brings not destruction in his wake right now. He brings blessing. And he starts off with these eight blessings. He says, he says in verse, verse 3, the first of the Beatitudes in week 1, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, the idea with blessed are the poor in spirit, it's, 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 it's spiritual bankruptcy. It's someone who's, who's beggarly. Bless you. It's someone who, who, who has the beg, and it's the idea of, of, of someone just sitting, sitting by the roadside, just begging for what they need. It's understanding their spiritual depravity, their, their inability to accomplish anything on their own and needing something from someone. And beggars, like Brandon, Brandon said in week one, beggars do what? They beg, right? It's poor in spirit. It's coming before the Lord, broken spiritually and begging for what you cannot accomplish on your own. And the second last week um, was blessed are those who mourn. And the idea with mourning is not mourning the loss of a job or mourning an illness or mourning the loss of a loved one, but it's, it's, it's mourning the sin that you have in your life. It's, 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 it's the worst type of anguish that we could feel. It's being grieved internally in the depth of your soul for the sin that would separate you from a holy God. And then with that mourning, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted it says that Jesus will comfort us in our affliction. And it's not the afflictions of sickness and illness. Yes, we do find comfort in those things, but it's comfort from the sin that afflicts us. And when we're poor in spirit, we recognize that spiritual bankruptcy, and we come before the Lord begging, and we mourn over that sin that separates from us. We'll be comforted. So this week, we'll be looking at the third beatitude, and that's blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So what comes to mind whenever we think of the word meek? We tend to think of weakness for some, maybe because it, it rhymes possibly, I don't know, but meekness is weakness oftentimes. But we picture, you know, sometimes we picture this, this feeble person, you know, a meek boy, a meek child is someone who gets picked on at school who gets bullied, he needs someone to stand up for him because he's so feeble and small that he can't fend for himself. He can't take up for himself. That's how, how we look at meekness. And that's a negative thing in our culture as we look at that. We, we, we look at bullying and picking on someone as negative, but also we don't want to be the meek person that needs someone to stand up for him. Right? But oftentimes meekness is looked at as weakness. But a good example of meekness is, is it really should be is someone who coming to you who feels that they've done wrong to you and they seek forgiveness. That's meekness. But here in a second, I'm going to play this video. And, and the reason that, that I'm showing you this video is because I think everyone in here will instantly be able to identify with the character that they see. But it is a very, very good extra biblical example of what meekness really is. So y'all check this out real quick. So Superman, my favorite superhero, next to Captain America, Iron Man, Hulk, and Thor, and <laughs> Iron Man, I just revealed my geekness. <laughs> 
But Superman, everyone, you know, when you hear the name Superman, you know, what's the first thing that pops into your head? Power, right? Strength, might, right? He sits there and he looks through. He has x-ray vision. He looks through a wall, right? He can make laser beams come out of his eyes, right? Faster than a speeding bullet, bullet can jump over a building in a single bound, right? We think strength and power whenever we think Superman. But what's on display here in this clip? That's why I love this clip. That's why I love that part of the movie. It's probably the best part of the movie. The rest of it is eh. But that part of the movie, you have mankind with all of their supposed power and might pointing everything that they have, all their guns, their cannons, their tanks, they're all pointed at this one individual. And what is this individual doing? He's flying. He's floating in the air right there. Not only that, he has come not to do harm to them. He has come surrendering to them, but nonetheless, he is flying. And what mankind does is points everything they have at it, just waiting for him to do something out of line so that they can destroy it or destroy him. But nonetheless, he is flying. So, But you just see the power there, just him floating in the air, but he is submitting himself and surrendering himself to them. And I love that picture. And then the next thing, he's being led down the hallway. He, he's, he's, got, he's got handcuffs on him. He's being led down a hallway. He's placed in an interrogate, interrogation room. Then he's sitting behind a table from Lois Lane. And she asks him, why did you let them handcuff you? Well, it wouldn't have been much of a surrender if I hadn't. Right. That is meekness. He contains power, might that, 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 that can't be measured in this world, and yet he would allow them to handcuff him, and he did it so that they feel better about him sitting there. And then she asked him, and you see the contrast here. So I love about that this this scene is the contrast between between his meekness, his humility to to surrender himself to an authority that he's not even subject to. And then she asked him, "What's the S stand for?" Well, where I'm from, it's not an S; it means hope. And what is her response? And her response is the arrogant, prideful, worldly response. Well, here it's just an S. He flies around doing superhero things, saving people as he does, and he's flying around with a symbol of hope on his chest. And the only response that Lois Lane has for him in that is, well, here it's just an S. And that's the distinction that's being made there between the meekness of the power that is properly controlled in Superman to submit to an authority he's not subject to on behalf of those very people. And then the other side of the table is, well, here, what you say you are is just an S. But meekness in the Greek, the word is praus. And it's a word that means mildness, means a gentleness. You know, in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, it comes from the same root word there for meek. It's meekness. It's a fruit of the Spirit. So when we think of meekness and we think of it as in our world, the upside down way of thinking is that it's weakness, but it's a fruit of the Spirit that comes from the Spirit, which comes from God. So how would we call something that comes from God weakness if it's a fruit that comes out of the life of a Christian? But it's gentleness. It's a proper balance between anger and indifference. Right, meekness is watching the news and seeing the wickedness of the world played out on our TV screen and not being indifferent about it, but at the same time, not going off the handle, being angry and yelling at the TV on account of what we see. But it's a balance between the two. It's having a righteous anger at the wickedness of the world, but not being indifferent to it. Two, it's power that's properly controlled, such as Superman sitting there with handcuffs on. But it's like a racehorse that's sitting in the chute, waiting to just let loose all that power that he has, all the vigor and power that a racehorse has. But it sits inside the chute and it sits controlled until the right time when those doors fly open and then it explodes out of it. Meekness is humility. It's not prideful. It submits, it's, it submits and works under a proper authority. Meekness goes to work and works for a boss that you don't like and you may not agree with, but you submit to his authority because he is your boss. That's not fighting against him. That's not constantly bumping heads with him. That's not constantly going out of your way to do what you think you should be doing instead of what your boss is telling you to do. 
Meekness submits to that because he is the authority that's over you. And meekness has a disregard for one's own rights and privileges. It's not selfish. It looks to, the, to, to others' ends instead of your own. Superman is a good example, but we would be remiss this morning if we didn't go to a biblical example of meekness. Directly, you could look at Jesus for sure. Jesus is the ultimate example of meekness. You have God who came as a man, fully God, healing the sick, having his power on display. He may not have been floating in the air, but he did God-sized things through his entire ministry. And then he willingly submitted to the very people that he came to save, and those very people put him on the cross that he came to die for. That is meekness. But before that happens, if you turn with me to um, Matthew chapter 8, not Superman, not Jesus, but we're going to look at a, a man here this morning that gives us a good example of what it means to be meek and what meekness looks like. Starting in verse 5, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward appealing to him. Now, a centurion, this is a Roman centurion, and, and at this day and time, right, Israel is occupied by Rome. Right? So this centurion you know, is, 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 is a Roman centurion. He's an army. He's an officer in an army. He's somewhere between a high-ranking, uncommissioned officer or a captain in a modern army. You know, he was in charge of about maybe 100 soldiers, and a Roman legion, legion that was fully staffed had about 60 groups of these soldiers. Right? So this centurion had, had status, he had authority, and he had some power behind him. Right? And Romans at this time, they occupy, and under their authority is Israel, namely the Jewish people. So Jesus being a Jew, and here it says at the beginning of this, that this Roman centurion came forward appealing to him. So a Roman officer appeals down to a Jewish man. That doesn't happen. Right? If, if, his own, if his own superiors were to know that he went to a Jewish man and appealed to him, and look at what he says next. He says, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. He calls him Lord. He doesn't go to him and say, hey, Jewish man, my, suffer, my servant's suffering. He goes and calls him Lord. Immediately, he recognizes Jesus as someone who has authority that is greater than his own, despite his status and his rank. And he says, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he's going to Jesus here, and he doesn't necessarily ask him a question. But you get in that, you get the focus of why he went to Jesus. Is my, suffer, my servant is suffering. He didn't even go to Jesus on his own behalf or something. He went on the behalf of his servant, and again, in that culture, for a Roman centurion who has servants underneath him, in that culture, if a servant were, were to become sick, they're not going to spend money to heal that servant. If the servant doesn't get well, they will just put them out and get another servant. But instead, this centurion goes to Jesus, appeals to him who he recognizes as Lord and greater than he is, and says that my servant lies paralyzed and is suffering terribly I know you can do something about it. And Jesus, in verse 7, and he said to him, I will come and heal him. Now, again, whenever you think of someone, if you take aside Roman centurion, you just think a person has a friend or servant that's sick, and he goes to Jesus, the one that we know can heal that, and that he knows can heal that person. So he goes to Jesus, says, hey, my servant is sick. We would expect Jesus to say this, right? I'll come. I'll come and heal him. But again, in this culture and in the law, for a Jewish man to enter the home of a Gentile would make him unclean. It's an impure thing. So Jesus isn't going to go, according to the law, to a Gentile's house and enter the house and heal somebody. But yet Jesus says, I will come to him. And the I is emphatic. It's almost like Jesus is asking him, like, I will come and heal? I will come and heal him? And the centurion replies to him, and this is key here, how the centurion replies to Jesus in this. He says, Lord, again, he says, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. He says, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. It's not even a matter of racial difference with the centurion. 
He says, all you have to do is say the word. You don't even have to be there. You don't have to come. You don't have to lay hands. I recognize the authority and the power you have. And then verse 9, he gives this analogy to describe that authority that Jesus has over illness and over sickness. He says in verse 9, for I too am a man under authority. Now again, he says, I too am a man under authority. And he's talking to Jesus. So he's realizing that there is someone that Jesus is subject to. That there's an authority that's even over Jesus. And he says, I too am a man under authority. And like you, Jesus, I have those that I am in authority over. And whenever I say go, or they go, when I say to the soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. He said, I know what it, what, it, what it is to have authority, and when I tell people to go do things, because of my authority, they go do it. Jesus, I understand that there's one that's in authority over you. I understand the authority that you have, and the authority that you have, like the authority that I have, when I tell a servant to do, all you have to do is say, illness, go, and it's going to be gone. That's the understanding that the centurion has with Jesus. All rank, all office, all status, all of that is gone The centurion is completely humbled, a man laid bare, going before who he knows to be superior to him, recognizing the power that he has and is saying, all you got to do, Jesus, is say the word, and my servant, whom I love and care about, will be healed. That's the idea of meekness. Leaving our high place to go to a low place, poor in spirit, knowing that you can't do this on your own, you need power greater than what you have. And going to him. And then Jesus in verse 10 says this. He says, when Jesus heard this, he marveled. He marveled at the man. In the Greek, the word for marveled there is only used two times in the New Testament in regards regards to Jesus. And the other time it's used is in Mark 6, verse 6. And it's where Jesus marveled at the unbelief of his own people. It says that when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. So all of a sudden you're a disciple of Jesus who follows Jesus and you see this, 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 um, this discord or this, this conversation between Jesus and this, and this Roman centurion. And as the Roman centurion is approaching, if you're Peter, you're probably putting your hand on your sword. What's about to happen? Then he appeals to him. And then Jesus says, I will come and heal him. Hang on, Jesus, you can't go in that man's house do that. And then Jesus, after he this, he marvels at what this Gentile says and says that nowhere in Israel have I found such faith as what I find in this man right here. Well, Jesus, hang on a minute. You called us. We're following you. We're God's chosen people. Do you think the disciples might have been arrogant in that or they might have took that gut punch and realized their own lack of humility, realize some of the pride that they may have as Jewish people. As Jesus marvels at the profound thing that this man says and the faith that he has. And then Jesus says in 11, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. And here, He says, I'll tell you, many are going to come from the east and the west, and they're going to recline at table with your patriarchs, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, hang on a second, Jesus. Us, your people, Israel, they're going to go into outer darkness, and all these other people are going to come and sit with our forefathers? That's what you're saying, Jesus? And he says, yes, that's what I'm saying. They're going to come and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Jesus then made a distinction between the faithful, those that would humble themselves, come to him, recognizing the need that they have that only he can fulfill versus those that think they have it figured out. And they think that they don't need it. He says, those that think they have it figured out, those are going to be cast out. And those that would come to me and humble themselves, they're going to recline at table. And he says, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. So blessed are the meek. 
Happy are the meek. You think this centurion went away upset or sad? No, he went away happy. He humbled himself, went to Jesus, asked something, and Jesus said, because of your faith, you believe, let it be so. You think he was surprised when he got home and saw his servant healed? I don't believe so. Happy is the man. Happy is the meek. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. So how do we do that? What's it, what's it look like to walk this out? What's it look like to live this out? How do, we, how do we live a meek life? How do we do meek things? What is meekness practically? Well, Jesus is quoting this from, from Psalm 39, verse 11. It's a Psalm of David, and, and he's quoting this, and Jesus says, uh, for the meek shall inherit the earth. But David in Psalm 37, verse 11, he says, but the meek shall inherit the land and they will delight themselves in abundant peace. And, and David in Psalm 37, he does kind of what Jesus did before, but he, he draws a distinction between, and a contrast between the wicked people of the world and the meek. And he says in verse 11, the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. It's, it's patient faith instead of self-assertion. The previous verses here expound on what it means to be meek. So if we look at verse 1 of Psalm 37, David says, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. Fret not. It's don't worry about them. Don't be angry about them. The word there is is like a burning. Don't let a burning happen within you. Don't let that bad taco come up on account of the evil in this world is what he's saying. Be not envious of wrongdoers. But why does he say this? Why are we not to worry about the evil in this world? Verse 2 gives the answer. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. He says the wicked, their days are numbered and they're counting down to zero. Don't worry about what's going on. It's the idea here, because he he says it again in verse 7b. He says, you don't have to go there with slides, but fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way over the man who carries out evil devices. And then um, verse eight, refrain from anger, forsake wrath, fret not yourself. It's the idea, just don't worry about these things because they are temporary. They're gonna pass away. Their time is going to come up. And as this distinction is being made, again, it comes to the why and how. How do we refrain from anger? How do we watch the news and not get mad at the wickedness in the world? How do we not yell at the TV? How do we not get mad and bitter and vengeful when someone drags our name through the mud? When the wickedness of this world spills over on us, how do we not get mad at it? And the answer David gives us. In verse 3, he says, 1, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. He just said simply, trust in the Lord. Do what you know is good. Dwell in the land, befriend faithfulness. And the word befriend, it's, it's, it's like feed on faithfulness. Dwell in the land, graze in the pastures of faithfulness. Let the Lord cultivate you there in the land. Be happy, do good, trust in the Lord and his provision in your life. Don't worry about what the evil doers are doing. It's the idea of, you know, why do good things happen to bad things, bad people and bad things happen to good people? That's the question he's addressing. But he says, one, trust in the Lord and do good. And two, he says, delight yourself in the Lord in verse four, right? Psalm one, verse two says, uh, blessed is the man who, sorry, I can't remember. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, not, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law, he meditates day and night. Again, blessed is the man. Happy is the man who does not do with the wicked, but delights in the Lord. David says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When we're delighting in the Lord, when we're trusting in the Lord, the desires of our heart and our wills are going to line up with his desires and his will. And when those two things align, he's going to give you every bit of his desire and his will, which lines up with yours, yours with his. And you will be blessed. Happy is the man when this happens, when you delight in the Lord. 
Verse five, the third thing is commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Right? It's the word there for commit is like roll. Roll everything out before the Lord. Right? Your job, your hobbies, commit your way, everything to the Lord and trust him. It's so and trust him to grow it. That's the idea. And he will act. That is a promise. Commit your way to the Lord and he will act on your behalf. And he says there that in verse six, he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. So when you're going through this world and the wickedness of this world gets all over you and seeks to drag you through the mud, slander your good name, make lies about you, hurt you, and do evil things to you, Jesus or God says, David says here that he will give you justice. Justice is as the noon day, but before justice comes, what comes first in verse six? He will bring forth your righteousness as the light. If we commit our way to the Lord, regardless of what we're going through in this life, if we allow him, he is going to bring about your righteousness. He's gonna work on your heart. If we're in the middle of something that is hurt, it's a circumstances that hasn't changed, perhaps we need to look at what hasn't changed. Look to the Lord, because he's going to work your righteousness as the light before any justice is done. But as the light, let your light shine so others can see. That's why meekness to me holds, holds, holds a special place amongst these beatitudes. It's because meekness, poor in spirit, mourning, you know, those things have to do with between us and God. It's internally how we relate to a holy God, right? And meekness is the same way. In humility, we have to be humi- humble and meek to come before a holy God and submit to him. But when we do that and that humbleness, that is on display for others to see. That is the light that people begin, begin to see. When your circumstances are bad and they're dire and everyone is expecting you to lash out at what's harming you and what's dragging you through the mud, Meekness displays something entirely different. It shows a righteousness that shines bright. It is a light that all can see. And then your justice as the noonday. There's no shadow that is cast on your reproach in the noonday. You shine brightly. And no no shadow is cast. And then verse seven, lastly, the fourth thing, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now, this is the most difficult thing for mankind to do is to sit still and wait for the Lord. It is near impossible for some people, very difficult for others, and not entirely easy for others still. It is a hard thing to do, to be still and wait for the Lord. And we can do this for a time when we know we need to do that because it sounds easy. Be still, just stop moving. We can, we can, we can jest and get it twisted, you know, that if I just sit at home, you know, the Lord, you know, be still and wait for him. He's going he's gonna to come do something. Not necessarily. But we can sit at home and, well, it's not happening. I'm going to start making some phone calls. You know, I'm just going to help him out. You know, it's very hard to sit and be still and wait for the Lord to work and to do in our lives, in our circumstances. But he says, fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. In the second part of seven there, the man who carries out evil devices, if you look back at, at four, God will give you the desires, desires of your heart. He will bring forth your righteousness in six and your justice as the noonday. That's what Jesus brings forth. That's what God brings forth in us. But the evil, all that they bring forth is evil devices. They carry out their evil. And eight, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall shall inherit the land. Patiently wait. Passion gets what it wants now, but loses it. It doesn't last. But patience gets what it wants last, and it lasts forever. Patiently wait for the Lord. Verse 10, in just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. 
It says, though you look at his place, he will not be there. There will come a day when the, when the evil, the wicked in this world will wither and pass away and it will simply not be there anymore. And then the meek at that point shall inherit the land. And David at this point, he's, he's, he says the meek shall inherit the land. So what land is David talking about? He's talking about the promised land. At this point in his life, the promised land, the land that was promised to Abraham in Genesis, wasn't fully possessed until King David some 1,200 years later. Moses, Moses got to see the promised land, right? God made a promise, with Moses, made a promise to Moses. His covenant was Mo, with Moses was, today I set before you a blessing and a curse. If you keep my commandments and you don't follow after other gods, I'm going to bless you. But if you don't keep my commandments and you start to look after other gods, I'm going to curse you. And I'm going to cut off your people. I'm going to cut off the people from the land. It doesn't void the promise to Abraham. It just adds condition on it that all of a sudden we have to be, they have to be obedient to the Lord to inherit the land. And it's not until King David, a man after God's own heart, that he finally fully possesses what was promised to Abraham. And here King David says that the meek shall inherit the land when all the wickedness of this world is gone. The land the meek will inherit. And then Jesus in Matthew, he applies it not, not territorially, not physically, but he applies it. It's the ultimate vindication of the meek. It's salvation for the meek, salvation for the humble, salvation for those that would that would recognize their spiritual depravity, they would mourn over that sin, and they would humble themselves before a holy God. And he says that they will inherit, not the land, but they will inherit the earth. They will be vindicated. Jesus gives them what they would not seek to take for themselves. It's the difference. But blessed are the meek, happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And I'll end with this. Um, there's a guy named Nick Walenda. If you've ever heard of him, he's most known for, um, for uh, walking tight ropes. Um, he, walked the, he has the world record for walking a tight rope over um, Niagara Falls uh, at 13 years old, the youngest person to ever do that. But um, held, he holds several, several Guinness, Guinness World Records. He walked a tight rope across the Grand Canyon. Um, just was known for these, these, these death defying feats that he would do. But one thing, other thing he was also known for, he was known as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. And he was asked one time, how is it, Nick? Nick, how are you, how do you remain humble? In your success and everything that you do and all the praise that you get from people, how is it that you remain humble amidst all of that? And he says that after his, after his shows, after he does what he does, he stays around and he picks up trash and debris that people leave behind. He picks up after the very people that come and praise him as he is doing these things and doing these shows. And he says this, he says, three hours of cleaning up debris is good for my soul. Humility does not come naturally to me. And I would say that humility doesn't come naturally to any of us. But humility does not come naturally to me. So if I have to force myself into situations that are humbling, so be it. I do it because it's, my, it's a way to keep from tripping. As a follower of Jesus, I see him washing the feet of others. I do it because if I don't serve others, I will be serving nothing but my ego. We are inherently, we're born into sin, but that sin's, sin brings about self-centeredness. We are all about ourselves if we don't mindfully think of others and put others first. We can't fully do that without the Holy Spirit. You can't. It is a fruit of the Spirit that comes out of us from the Holy Spirit to fully do that. But if we're not looking to others, if we're not humbling ourselves daily, we're only going to be serving ourselves. We're not yelling at the TV on behalf of those that were harmed by the wicked that we see. We're yelling at the TV because it makes us mad. And that lets out that anger to make us feel better about what we're seeing. If we're not careful, we will serve our ego. We won't serve anyone else. But blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
And there's a promise of what's to come, of eternity come. When wicked is gone and all that's left is the meek, everybody that's going to get along, the meek live, live, live happier, simpler lives every day because they're not concerned with all the evils. Not that they're not concerned, but they don't worry about everything that's wrong in the world because they know that Jesus will vindicate his people and he will make right all of those wrongs. Lord, thank you for today. Lord, thank you for your church. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for, Lord, the promise, the numerous promises in it, Lord. Lord, I thank you for making a way to us, a way for us, Lord. Lord, I thank you for, for giving us salvation. I thank you for giving your son. Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross, and I thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for leading me daily because without you, I would not be a meek-minded person. I would not realize and see the failures that I have, Lord, the areas where I need to grow, the areas that I need to let go of, the areas that I need to humble myself in and seek your face, Lord, so that I can better serve you and serve others, Lord. And I just, I pray that you continue to work that in my heart. I pray for your people, Lord, this morning. I pray, Lord, that that we would see and come to understand the importance and the weight of what it means to humble ourselves before you and before others, Lord. And just continue to touch, help teach us to do that, Lord, that we would trust in you, that we would delight in you, we would commit to you, Lord, and we would be still, Lord, and we would wait for you. Holy Spirit, teach us to wait. Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.